Let's move on now to Sebastian de Hulieu. I mean, you are a kind of entrepreneur par excellence. You have Playfish and a number of other companies we'll talk about. Uh, but the thing is about you is that you started and were kind of ahead of the curve. But tell me how you started and who you started with. So, so we started um, before Playfish with another company doing games on mobile phones in the early 2000s. Um, and what happened was that mobile phones were black and white, and most people were starting to get them. And we felt that this was an amazing platform that was not designed for games, but that games was going to be one of the most successful use for that new platform. But you were a civil engineer. You had a, one computer programmer, mm -hmm. one civil engineer, an economist, and a financial guy. And that, you created this uh, extraordinary company. That's right. And, and as a matter of fact, that crew has kept working together for the past 10 years. So uh, I think it's, 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 um, it's a testament to the fact that the new gamer is not your traditional stereotype but it is more a group of people who enjoy you know, an, an activity that's played together. Mm -hmm. And that has, we try to do this on mobile phones, and we, I think, have really come out of age with social networks, which have given us the, uh, um, the technology uh, enabler, if you want, to make that happen inside a game. So explain, for example, how, explain how your restaurant game works. So very much like what Jorgen described, the essence of what we do is we've changed what a game is. A game used to be a single player experience, you between, between you and the machine, and we've turned it into an experience that's fun because it involves your friends, it involves people you know. Um, and the game, you know, we try to go after universal themes, so one of the most universal themes is run a restaurant with your friends. So we give you a blank like canvas. A, it's like playing Sims in a way. Exactly, and I think we'll see a short clip that illustrates that. Um, but essentially you're given a blank canvas, and you can, do, you can create whatever restaurant you want, from a sushi place to an Italian to a French uh, to an Irish pub, and then you hire your friends to work for you, and you can dress them up as you know, bunnies if you want to, uh, and you have to feed them because your friend will stop working for you every three hours. So every three hours you need to go back in the game and uh, show a mark uh, 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 of caring for your friends and feed them bananas or sandwiches, and therefore you create this high level, high frequency engagement between players inside the game. The game is just there to give an excuse for the social interaction. Should we see something of what you do? Absolutely. We're living through an amazing time right now. There is a tectonic shift happening in the game industry towards games becoming more social. We believe that there's a special chemistry at the heart of the game industry. Those moments of intense creativity is what we're trying to nurture. really get a lot out of these daily interactions with these games. They're not your traditional games you find on the console. The games actually just post on the web. The players are everywhere from Silicon Valley to Hong Kong. Basically, it, it's like rapid evolution, right? You try something that doesn't work, you move on to the next one until it fits perfectly. Playfish games are made by people who love games, and they're made by people who have a lot of fun making those games. Really exciting to me to think about how people will respond to it, to think about how they'll interact with it, oftentimes, I'm guessing, in, in ways that we won't even expect. So much room to go into that we're only beginning to sort of understand the, the potential. So, money, let's talk money. Because originally you thought it was going to be 50% so uh, advertisers, 50% consumers, but that wasn't right, was it? That's right. Um, what happens is that today most of our revenue comes from uh, our players paying us directly. Now those games, uh, I, should, I should specify, are free to play games. So we never actually ask anyone to pay us. We give the entire game for free, not, not just a portion of it, but the entire gameplay experience is entirely free to anyone for as long as you want it. And then what we do is we sell virtual items inside those games to enhance the experience even better. So um, if you want a fancy equi equipment in your restaurant, uh, or nicer chairs, or um, a cuter <laughs> hat, then you can elect to pay for it in, in small amounts, 
um, you know, two or three euros or larger amounts up to 100 euros at, uh, within a single payment. And you can do this as often as you want. And that, what, and what, that, that stays with you. So if you want a KitchenAid mixer, you have it forever. That's right. And, uh, and, we th and we thought that initially, you know, advertisers were going to play a large part in this ecosystem because one of the revolution, obviously, is audience. As you've seen in the video, mm -hmm. we've, we've distributed about nearly 400 million games now. Um, and so, you know, that obviously represents a mass market uh, that advertisers are keen to tap. But what we've really discovered is that, is that players are so keen in, in, in valuing the experience so much over time that they're actually uh, are paying us directly, although the game is free. So, it also, the idea, I mean, it's still quite, is it not still quite isolating? Because although they're, they're virtual friends you know, in groups, maybe ex real friends, but they also have other friends that come in, it's still something you do alone, isn't it? Well, what we try to do is go back to the origin of game. In, in some respect, video games have been a kind of anomaly in the evolution of games since thousands of years, which have been people playing together. Um, and we've tried to go back to those roots, you know, the, the family nights around a board game, people playing you know, Lego together. Uh, and the, the, the issue is that, you know, mo in our current society, most of the friends and most of your family members are dispersed geographically. Uh, mm -hmm. Or if not, you know, they don't have the same uh, time allotment uh, uh, for, for, for entertainment. So rather than Skype and chat to each other, you play a game that, with your cousin in Adelaide. That's right. But what's amazing is that a lot of the, you know, talking back to payment, a lot of the reasons why people pay is not because of the game, it's because of their real friends. So for example, Valentine's Day. On Valentine's Day, um, we, we, last, last Valentine, we sold about 20 million virtual roses. <laughs> and people were giving, buying this not because of the rose had any meaning in the game, it had not, but because they were gifting them to you know, their Valentine or prospective Valentine you know, uh, in the game. And as a matter of fact, you know, this went the so Ken, far. The Kenyan rose industry collapses for a day. Because <laughs> well, well, the interesting thing is that we actually bundled a real rose, or we offered uh -huh. a real rose with the virtual rose. And we said, you know, whilst you're at it, you might as well want to consider buying a real rose for your Valentine, hint, hint. So you can do that with a Maserati as well then. So, <laughs> so what, we so try that next time. Yeah, so what are the tie-ups with, because that, that has a commercial proposition, doesn't it, that actually you might like to own a particular piece of kitchenware virtually, but then you press a button and it takes you to where you can actually buy the kitchenware. Absolutely. I think that the, the general concept is that it's a sandbox. Those games are not prescriptive. We just create you know, an apartment or a restaurant, and then we let you play with it. And people actually want an element of reality within that virtual world. So they want to, when they serve a drink in the restaurant, they want that drink to be Coke or Dr. Pepper or, you know, or, or, or a juice brand that they recognize. And they actually ask us to go and pursue deals to bring that element of reality inside, inside the game. And do you have any idea uh, what the demographics are of, of your games? Absolutely. So the traditional demographic for games, as you, uh, as you probably know, is a you know, younger male uh, uh, between the age of sort of 16 to 24. Our demographic is about 50% gender split and uh, ranges from the age of 16 to 34 as the 80% demographic. And do we know where they are in the world? So oh. our audience is currently 30% America, 30% Europe, 30% Asia. And as a matter of fact, we were a global startup from day one because we had an office in Beijing, in London, and in San Francisco as we started. And that's a new reality in the game industry is that it's never served geographies like, let's say, Indonesia, mm -hmm. because the cost of distribution and the, and the cost of the friction in payment were prohibitively expensive. Now, because all, all, our, all we ship is virtual items, mm -hmm. we can actually address those markets much, much more easily. Well, also, I mean, what is the, what is the most subverting thing uh, players have done to uh, one of your games? What's the kind of wildest thing that's happened? Um, very much like I think you know, I, I, I recognize some of the, the community element in what Jorgen was saying. Uh, people are making movies with our games all the time, so they recreate anything from you know Star Wars to uh, early black and white you know uh, uh, movies using game as a canvas. Mm. So I think the, the, the most the most amazing thing and the Chainsaw Massacre a video with Pet Society, which are those cute little animals that you saw there, was kind of you know the most interesting thing that we, that, 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 that we've You'd seen. You'd say interesting. If that happened in Lego, it'd be a lot of trouble. But, but it, Has it? But, but it, just shows that, it just shows that players don't want to be dictated well, what to do. You well, know? I was going to say the other thing was because you heard George, George Osborne's talk about, well, not quite talking about the Arab Spring, but talking about, we could talk about what happened in Iran uh, 18 months ago. And then a lot of that was led by social media, Twitter and so forth, getting around all the different uh, issues about communication. Do people hack in for bad reasons? They do. Um, I think that as soon as you have an engaged community, you know, one of the, the, the hallmark of an engaged community is that 
the most engaged users care so much as to want to you know, deconstruct what you've built and reconstruct it in a way that they see uh, 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 more fun or, or, or more fitting for their own purpose. Many of this is you know, access to the virtual currency uh, or, or trying to you know, preempt the items that we, that we roll out. So we have virtual stores and they, they, they switch over at midnight on a, on a Sunday night. And, but we actually load those items on a Friday or on a Thursday. And so you know, people re reverse engineer the game so that they can <laughs> boast to the community about what's to come. So right. those, 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 those kinds of things. But we think it's a good thing because those users who are the most engaged uh -huh. Don't, do you, you know, do you, could spend their time you know, elsewhere. Do you solicit from users ideas? I mean, what happens? Because you said to me earlier that it, you weren't saying this arrogantly, but you were just saying, we have no one to follow. You know, we are in the van, and so therefore, you know, we are, we're looking to move forward. And I wondered if some of the gamers are the ones that help you move forward. Absolutely. I mean, we cannot claim to know everything. And when we have games that engage communities of 50 million people, you know, in those 50 million, you have the best artists, the best programmers, the best you know, sort of creative minds, and they, they, they let us know what they want to see in the game. They tell us that they want a pink jacuzzi in the game next Monday, and they're ready to pay for that. So, you know, this is give, transferring ownership from the creative process from inside the company to the, uh, giving it back to the community, which again, you know, those games don't belong to us. We're just a caretaker. We're just there to provide the tools for the community.